I, it's like supposed to be in conversation, so uh, please don't ask any questions until the end. <laughs> um, but yeah, any, 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 I look forward to the, the notion of an exchange rather than this being too much of a formal talk. Hey, I've got friends here, yay. Okay. Um, does anyone have any uh, uh, preference, experience with uh, uh, love of political satire of any kind? Am I, am, I, is, am I asking too quick a question to involve the audience? Okay. Well, uh, Rahel said I shouldn't go into too much theory. Um, and of course, that's exactly what a PhD is about, as I've discovered the difference between um, masters and PhD. Uh, but I will be looking at contemporary political satire, and we can kind of look at some of the definitions of satire, which is really kind of key to the whole picture. Uh, and then I will kind of zip through uh, some examples within Southeast Asia, and with a highlight, though, on a particular passion, a lovely, lovely example from Indonesia. Um, and who is familiar with Bahasa Indonesia in the room? Yay! Okay, so I'll be happy to translate uh, as if I'm so au fait myself. Okay, um, so I, I, it is a cross between, I try not to be too, too, too talky, but, but um, uh, and especially because it's about humor, there's this one, uh, Jonathan Miller, he's a medical doctor as well as a theatre director, and um, he says that basically, you know, there's a dilemma. If you're a humor studies researcher, you feel you have to be funny. Um, but he says, well, no, that's as if you were a surgeon um, and you're dealing with cancer and you need to have the disease, you know, before operating on it. Um, so, uh, and, and it, but it gets worse uh, in the sense that um, Anybody who dissects humor, um, it's an operation in which the patient usually dies. So on that happy note, let me continue. Uh, my own interest begins with uh, an interest in the effects of humor, a closer look at the idea that laughter is the best medicine, where the health benefits of humor are articulated and assumed as positive. My master's degree was in the history of science, medicine, technology, where I first got interested in humor as a way to laugh through my study. Um, I'm pursuing the same important methodology with my PhD, which has now taken me for over a, a year and a half, and I have two years to go. Um, my question is really, at least for my thesis, is you know, if, if humor is the best medicine, then how come I can't go to Institute Jantung Nagara or University Hospital and claim for half an hour of humor on my AI insurance. Um, the, there are, uh, it turns out that there is um, a lot of anecdotal evidence that's strong for laughter as the best medicine, because we all know what a good laugh is, um, and we're happy to share it, oops, and we're happy to share it with somebody who, um, who may enjoy the same thing, but uh, in terms of clinical evidence for humor being uh, uh, as, as good as all that, uh, well, it's a bit equivocal. It's a bit um, meh. So uh, humor has only largely been tested in the depths of despair in geriatric and old people's homes or in pediatric cancer wards. And God knows that even to put a tiny dose of humor in my tumor and the stomach turns. Re results reported in a well-known study, the most well-known study so far in the New England Journal of Medicine, shows that while tremors have been reduced, depression itself, not much, and if then, um, not for long. Still, I do hope to laugh my way through my PhD. Um, okay, I start with the notion of uh, the idea of poking fire. Fi we know that satire of all various, many forms of humor, kind of cuts close to the bone. And I've just put this up here because it's the story of Pandora's box. And um, uh, Prometheus, the problem with a lot of uh, Southeast Asian studies on humor is that you kind of start with the Greeks. Everything starts with the Greeks. Um, 
And of course, you know, there's a huge dislocation that has to happen, but you imbibe first uh, about the stories around the Greek mythology. But uh, the, the, I'll go through a little bit more about what the dual nature of satire is, but here we have this idea that fire, it's something that warms, um, it's something that blisters, and can it actually burn the house down? Uh, my interest in humor has also been, I just want to say, has been uh, breastfed by various bodies. The discipline of humor studies is one of those. It's multidisciplinary, as is the Department of Southeast Asian Studies, where my PhD is based. Um, multidisciplinary is important because satire typically gets locked into literary studies, English literature and, and uh, language. Um, but if you are in a multidisciplinary area, then obviously you get to carry the whip for various um, subjects and of course that for humor studies includes philosophy, psychology, neurology and public health. Um, now that uh, City University in Hong Kong has a master's course in humor studies, we can say that the trend has reached Asia. But satire of course is a long-standing occurrence and interest in Chinese studies, Arabic studies and so forth. Uh, shows a lot of interest and a lot of e evidence but the discipline of humor studies itself not so. Um, so if we go to the idea that laughter is the best medicine, let's have a look at the, the ideas of how laughter actually is not only something that gives you joy. There are problematic uh, uh, cases of what happens. Um, Southeast Asia, of, of course, is where I'm talking about. And uh, you may be interested to know that it's actually a term that only started in, uh, from the Second World War. Although if we think about sort of Southeast Asia, it was, well, it was always Southeast Asia. I mean, where were we? Of course we were, you know, south of, or well, somewhere, and um, east of somewhere else. Uh, otherwise, there's a great big leap into ancient uh, uh, references. So Nusantara, there's all kinds of, um, but uh, it's, a moving, it's a moving target. And uh, it's interesting to see how some people use ASEAN and, and Asian interchangeably. Uh, <clears throat> we can say that um, contemporary Southeast Asia, I mean, bear with me for a minute. This is Southeast Asian studies, so I kind of have to go through this a little. There are, considering the incredible influence of Indian culture on Southeast Asia, there are no Indian maps of Southeast Asia whatsoever are known. Now you might say, well, of course, if Southeast Asia only resulted from the Second World War, then that makes sense. Um, China, there are third century maps about the region, uh, especially Cheng He's voyages uh, and Arab stories. Uh, Arab stories begin from around the seventh century. But uh, let me go into the... Um, the other interest of, of, of mine. Now, um, I might say that the interesting thing about a PhD thesis from a master's one is that you have to come up with something really original. Now, there's kind of original from one to ten, you know, like one is kind of eggshells of a blue finch, and egg, two is eggshells of a red finch. Um, but I would say, I would give a five for the human studies area to um, psychologist Willem Ruchs. His dogged study of gelotophobia has now been conducted in about 73 countries. Gelotophobia is, of course, the fear of being laughed at. It was a clinical um, uh, condition, but it's recently been uh, defined as a subclinical definition. Um, and you'll be pleased to know that gel gelotophilia is the joy of being laughed at. Um, and we should be pleased to know that the severe incidence of gelotophobia only occurs in 0.05% of a population, generally speaking. So maybe that's the two people who just came in there. Um, sorry, I won't say anything offensive. Um, uh, interestingly enough, the highest incidence occurs so far in Germany which might explain the poor reputation for humor that Germans apparently have come to have. But it could just be Angela Merkel. The foremost scholar on um, inter intercultural humor is probably Christy Davis. 
uh, from Ireland, as it happens, and he concludes that there is actually more diversity in humor within countries than there is between countries. So we can't get away with saying that you know Singaporeans have no sense of humor compared to Malaysians, um, but we could maybe say that those from Sabah, like myself, laugh easiest and loudest because we're always used to being treated as the outsider, and have to. And you can hear, of course, Valentine laughing very much at that. Um, Gender and humor studies gives us uh, an interesting kind of range of uh, scholarship about humor studies, but unfortunately, a lot of it sort of, you know, you feel like you make two steps forward and 10,000 years step back. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of study around how uh, men are afforded um, higher social standing and therefore they have more confidence about speaking. Uh, in public and can be more assertive and dominant, um, but more recent studies, because uh, humor studies is taking off, you know, uh, shows that in fact uh, there are many wonderful examples of female co uh, comedians and diversity of um, gender and sexuality uh, for the variety of satire. Uh, this is really the key question of what I'd like to look at. It warms, it blisters, but does it burn the house down? Um, it may be that uh, for some people, um, satire is very scientific. That is, it takes a lot of people to agree on the same thing, and it must be reproducible. Science is, you know, brought us the notion that the size of a brain is an indication of a person's intelligence, that Pluto was a planet that tobacco smoking has nothing to do with lung cancer. So um, consensus is very important to science and to satire until such time as we change opinion. If only because people get offended. If we all agree that portraying a prime minister or two as an evil clown is okay, then it is probably funny, maybe, and even it is biting. We might prefer a prime minister portrayed as Maharaja, but it's not going to work at least if we don't know what a Maharaja is or may be offended by such a portrayal because every Maharaja we ever knew was a really nice guy. Literary studies, of course, take up a lot of the etymology and meanings and histories of satire and its hist uh, um, I like one definition in particular. I hope you do too. This is an Ethiopian proverb. Um, and uh, it's a great way to show that satire, to take satire out of its literary precious area um, because there is such a thing as the satiric gesture, there is such a thing as um, it does not need to be a really clever joke, we all get it, um, uh, we might not like it but that's a bit more complex. For a more formal definition, here's one, whoops, that might satisfy. Literary studies, of course, is taken up very much with forms of satire. Um, and uh, this is M. H. Abrams, who is the kind of god of definitions of literary terms, so um, you can't get more official than this. Uh, but of course, the etymology of satire, uh, forgive this sort of um, beautiful color scheme here, but this is really just to show that um, I'm referring to satire the long and kind of not so interesting story about how satire has come about um, only is because we're using, I'm using the language of English so far. Uh, but there are many, many references to satire or to versions of satire. Um, and for example, uh, Hamdan's uh, work in 2006 looks at uh, the competitions of uh, these are mutual defamations of satirical nature arising from traditions in Arabic. Um, and uh, if I can chop and change to Che and Davis, they look at how Mao Zedong considered satire to be important, um, uh, but not humor, which is a new definition of humor which came about in 1924. So, um, Taking up the, 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 you know, all the various words and terms for satire, it's important at which point are we talking, because it means different things at various times, and of course it means different things in, in um, different languages. Uh, there is no joke unless also a laugh. That actually takes a, a, a theory of um, verbal humor 
to make that point, and then we can talk about it in an academic sense. But uh, if we were looking for satire and trying to find it and distinguish it from farce or from slapstick or from uh, uh, various other forms, we might safely say at least contemporary satire that you have irony, you have parody, you have hyperbole or exaggeration, and litotes. These are the kinds of techniques used in satire and, politically, uh, and particularly in political satire. Uh, the, the tricky thing about satire has been understood for a while, if we look back at, to, the, to trace a notion of this dual nature. Um, Jonathan Swift, who is you know, typically used as an example of um, satire, uh, he talked about, um, he's the one who talks about you know, selling uh, Irish babies as a way of, of killing them as a way to kind of solve the Irish problem in, in, in Europe. Uh, the idea is that there's pleasure and public spirit. Satire has something that's really funny, and there are notions about the effects of satire uh, in that it has a purpose. It is mocking authority, it is mocking an idea, it is bringing down to size, bringing down to you know, e e a kind of equality um, uh, as, as its dual nature. So these are very conflicting uh, um, features. Uh, these, okay, let's go with Frederick Bogle's double structure, because uh, he talks about, he sets up this idea of satire as being something which is actually very conservative, because although we can, you know, we see political satire as being something that is challenging to uh, authorities, uh, Bogle has a notion that actually what it's doing is making clear distinction between you and the subject. And it's making, it becomes, the satirist becomes the moralist in a way. It starts to say what is good behavior and what is bad behavior. Um, and, oops, big pardon. Uh, and of course, Wyndham Lewis is someone who says satire is not moral involved at all. Uh, it's those who justify the nature of satiric art by the abiding righteous fervor of the satirist and satir, uh, satire's curative, miliative or restorative role are preserving fiction. Um, political satire, okay, everything is political. I mean, I, the subject is so broad, what can we look at? Well, I'm taking a more conventional sense of, of political, which is that it's, it's institutional. So, whoops, I think this is gonna, it's gonna, um, so I'm referring to government bodies, government, you know, po political figures and so on. Let me take this out. And contemporary by area is 1987 to 2016, and I include the traditional. The theories of humor, this is the last one, uh, is they are generally three, um, understood to be superiority, where you're using humor as a way to feel um, more higher than the other person. You look to put the other person down. The relief sense of humor is also, of course, something that, you know, so then we feel better, we have a release from what, well, whatever is the norm. And incongruity points to the idea that something that makes us laugh. There's something, if it's opposite to what we expect, that somehow triggers, and th there's some very interesting neuros uh, uh, neuroscience studies done lately in what happens. We just laugh. There is a, there is a mechanism that makes us laugh. So these are the two, uh, sorry, the three theories. Um, and of course, there's an older one, which is which is uh, uh, it's to do with middle middle aged version, but still very alive within traditional Chinese medicine. Um, if you're talking about before in the Middle Ages, there are four types of humor. There used to be four types of humor: black bile for melancholia, phlegm, which represented uh, uh, you know your your body being out of whack, yellow bile, um, and uh, and black bile. So you balanced all the humors if you wanted a balanced um, person. Qi in traditional Chinese medicine and the notion of ang in in Yunani medicine, these are versions of what um, the notion that, you know, when you are out of humor, you are not well balanced. Humor is, you know, in terms of its purpose, there's something that is very, very important to our survival and well-being. Um, okay. Sorry. Just a quick one just to show that, you know, diagrams are really important to look academic. 
Um, but what I like about Bogle's theory is that instead of focusing so much on the satirist, you look also uh, at the subject and in particular at the audience. Um, in a lot of the research that I've looked at so far, very little is done on the audience. Um, and considering that you know, the idea of a joke is that the audience has got to get it, uh, I think it's you know, kind of like writing a history of medicine and forgetting about the perspective of patients. Uh, so um, I'm going to be looking a lot at audience. If only there were more interesting things to look at audience rather than questionnaires, surveys, and the deadly Q&A after a theater performance, you know. Um, but hopefully there will be new ways. Okay. Uh, now I'd like to look at uh, this area of Southeast Asia, um, which, you know, yeah, upside down. The, 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 the first person that sort of made me think about regional influences and think about beyond a Malaysian example of, of anything was uh, Christian Jit, who, um, as it says, among others, is co-founder of Five Arts and, um, can I say it, Marian? Yeah. Mm, that did Marian, who's a um, widow, widow, and in, in her own right, I hate, you know, widow is such a, a, a weird word for me to say. She's a dancer and choreographer and, you know, theatre doyen. Um, and Christian was lucky enough to be married to Marian. So, okay. Christian, notably in his, uh, in his reviews, he took, he took uh, me out and I think many others into looking at regional influences rather than just um, uh, what was immediately next door. Okay, now Southeast Asian studies, if I think about Southeast Asian studies, what is Southeast Asian studies given that it's you know, this new thing, uh, at least since the Second World War? Um, well, there are these you know, rock star academics as far as I'm concerned, Ariel Herianto and Sumit K. Mandal, respectively Indonesian and Malaysian. And they have, um, they make very important points as far as I'm concerned for Southeast Asian studies. They say that a lot of satire is seen, and in fact, in this dominant theme of transition to democracy. It's been the dominant theme for the last 50 years. Uh, and the problem with it is that it's become a kind of, there's this distinct polarity between authoritarianism on the one side and democracy on the other, as if there were these perfect worlds, and as if, you know, um, the, um, uh, as it says there, democracy is universally good for all mankind, and authoritarianism is uniformly disastrous and morally repulsive. Well, yes, but, you know, people, some of us still go on living uh, in what some people call democracies or some people call authoritarianisms. The problem is that it's not wholly constituted by a coercive social order designed by a small elite. It's uh, and forced upon suffering subjects. Um, he, they rather, focus on the kinds of counter-narrative capacity that people have in relation to the official uh, 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 narrative. Uh, so, I mean, I'm just, these, these are the, go for example, these are other themes that Southeast Asian studies has been taken up with. Um, col colonial, pre-colonial, post-colonial uh, modernity, um, the importance of global and fluid unbounded conceptions within Southeast Asia. And the interesting thing is that South science and technology studies is now coming back into Southeast Asian studies. Um, but meanwhile, if we continue to look at why I like these two academics and why I think that for political satire they are, um, they are the two of them are alone or the strongest voices in saying that um, emergent challenges by social forces that include women, public intellectuals, arts workers, industrial workers, environmental and Islamic activists highlight a lesser known but also important counter-narrative capacity. And Sumit, in particular, gives recognition to activist artist workers, including those in theater in Malaysia and Indonesia, for crossing many social boundaries such as class, religion, ethnicity, and gender, to, as he nicely puts it, collectively, if not cooperatively, produce significant engagements with authoritarianism. Uh, it's very important, I think, not to be looking things at things in, in, in black and white. And this might be because, you know, 
my own background is Kachukan Zero, and my Yahoo account is Kachukan04 at uh, yahoo.com, and in, 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 in Indonesia is Blastran, which I think sort of sounds, I don't know, somehow more dangerous. But uh, Kachukan is so, so charming. Anyway, uh, so as the saying goes, that there's no uh, joke without somebody to laugh at it. Um, and if we look at why I'm, why I'm looking at 1987 and so forth, if you just look at the, that um, third area there, uh, I'll be looking at, in terms of theatre, I'll be looking at Instant Cafe Theatre Company uh, at, for television. I'll be looking at Republic Mimpi, news.com, which I'll be very happy to show you more about shortly. Um, and why? Because there is a political context around what happens. Um, so, you know, ICT, uh, it is set up partly in relation to the effects of uh, Operasi Lalang, um, but at the same time, there is a whole, you know, incredible movement of change. And who can remember the four-letter novel, word titled novel by a, a, you know, Nobel laureate, not Nobel laureate, but, you know, national laureate um, by Shannon Ahmad, which is shit, a, a.k.a. PM and even Bukima. Uh, this also points to a tradition of satires being, you know, as I mentioned, not just literary, but also um, bodily. Uh, Provence and Lent talk about Wayang clowns. There is no looking at satire in Southeast Asia without looking at Wayang. Champosari Wayang is kind of the most, some of the most contemporary forms of Wayang, at least uh, in, in Indonesia. Um, and there's been new work, which uh, I'll just zip through. Uh, Sunny Liu's The Art of Charlie Chan Ch Hot Chai. Has anybody read that book? Oh, it's, you must get it. Please get it. It's a, 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 a wonderful, I, there's a sting in the tail, there's a punchline to it. So if I tell you, it really spoils the whole thing. But that is a story of Singapore, and that looks at how Singapore has come about. Uh, and Kin Wee will be, is looking at that in, in more detail. David Jung, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, who's written about humor studies in Southeast Asia. And there's this you know, close analysis of humor in the Malaysian House of Representatives, which is, a, you know, um, that's how far uh, the humor's gone. But all it does, it looks at the kinds of structures of the jokes without looking at the jokes. Um, I don't know if that's kind of, you know, something which, which we have, have become used to in some way. But... Uh, there are reception studies um, which look at how the audience reads something and how it decodes something. Um, and uh, I think the aspect of audience is very important because when it comes to um, an analyzing it, we can say that following on from Bogle, if we look at uh, audience, satire, and subject, satirist and subject, we can see that um, the government is also a member of audience. We don't have to be looking at audience as, some, as someone who is um, non-government. Um, and there's a lovely book called A History of Science that includes a look at the Roman Catholic Church in Southeast Asia that shows how active apparent silence can be. The audience, and not only the satirist, is important in the creation and understanding of satire. Um, now, before I go into to this, uh, the, have, does anyone know who? These guys are, they're called the Moustache Brothers. And um, they were, their hands represent the name uh, of a student activist who was jailed um, in uh, Myanmar during the time of, you know, before the most recent elections for the first time. And if you went up, rather a bit like kind of wearing a yellow t-shirt maybe, if you went up and you hit, put your palm up like that, that meant um, you were showing support for the activist, um, activist in, in, in Myanmar. Otherwise, they performed, there are three generations now of, of uh, performers, and basically they, they, they lampoon, and they, um, the question now is having reached the nirvana of the first democratic elections, what happens, what are they going to be? lampooning next. Um, the issue of censorship is something which I think is, is kind of assumed in relation to, 
to satire. Um, now, Kathy Rowland, who is um, an independent scholar, she's based at uh, La Salle right now. Uh, she has done a lot of work uh, looking at um, censorship in, in Southeast Asia, particularly Malaysia and Singapore. Um, I won't copy what she has to say, but um, to add a thought, you know, from the perspective of Michel Foucault, the French intellectual who's writing about power so influential still, um, is his, perspe his perspective suggests that censorship laws not only control political satire, but it's possible to argue that these laws generate political satire. Um, if you, d you know, instant cafe theatre, yes, it owes its existence not only to Operasi Lalang, but also possibly to the idea of the Sedition Act 1948. Um, uh, for having not been used because arguably the threat of it is enough um, and there is of course a reason that there is you know an English language um, speaking urban audience so who cares but as Ariel Herianto writes um, revolution has come by the hand of the middle classes too and the all the examples that I use uh, by choosing theater television and um, memes these cross over into you, you know conventional notions of what middle, the middle class is. As fraught a notion as it is with writers like um, M. Bong, uh, who has written about how the rise of the middle classes in, in uh, Malaysia and in Indonesia in the 1990s, uh, how we cannot actually make these neat uh, Marxist perfect categories between working class, middle class, and um, upper class. But all the examples that I'm using uh, can be said to refer to um, middle class in the sense of who have access, who are literate, uh, and have access to, to um, being able to be in urban-based en environments. That's what, what I'm looking at. Um, but obviously, political sat satire, which it's not that political satire exists because of censorship laws. Um, if only, you know, also because there are social mores that don't need to be laws in writing for there to be areas that we know we cannot touch. Um, and, uh, you know, and neither does more censorship laws equate with better satire. Although I think there's maybe something, such a thing as inadvertent satire when you know, a police force, an attorney general must look high and low to find a law to charge a person for dropping yellow balloons in the vicinity of a prime minister. A kind of halwat balon, maybe, I don't know. But the tension between the threat and promise of laws um, is, is one which has uh, been influential so far. Alfian Saat, oh sorry, um, now, the Mustache Brothers, they are still going, you can uh, you know, it's, it's a sort of thing to do when you get to Young On, you should be, you know, go and see a show by the, by the Moustache Brothers. Um, but I do think, it, as I say, what they do next will be interesting to have a look at. Uh, Zar Ganar, and for those interested, that typeface is called Myanmar M. Uh, he, I, he might resemble somebody of a political party here in Malaysia. I, I didn't see it, but somebody pointed it out to me. Uh, he was also uh, a performer during um, the period of Aung San Suu Kyi's house arrest uh, and now um, he was actually on the night of like the gala night of you know he was asked to do a performance um, so again what is he going to be um, performing about next uh, Thailand Zhao Kuo Tun is my terrible pronunciation of this show, but this is an online satire show, uh, and it's called Shallow, Shallow News in Depth, which is a great title, and that's uh, Natapong on the left and Winyu on the right, uh, and they kind of play like the straight guy. So uh, Winyu is the straight guy, um, which is of course um, not to mean anything about his sexuality, but uh, Natapong is, is the sort of zany, a uh, 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 wacky fellow who sort of upsets um, what uh, Winyu is trying to do. And they really go very close cut to, you know, to, 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 so that some of what we may be more familiar with in Malaysian context, it, it seems very um, tame in comparison. Uh, Singapore, 
as we might expect, uh, as in the conventional theory of what a you know authoritarianism state or a democracy state is, you see they have to be problematized. Um, there are lots of satire. There's a lot of satire on news sites, um, but that's not to say that you know there isn't in theatre as well. Uh, my, I'll be looking quite closely at Wild Rice, which is a theatre company um, set up by, by Ivan Hain, and its resident playwright is Alfian Sa'ad. And um, there's occasionally, one of the things that Alfian has said lately is that, um, uh, you know, censorship helps him be more creative as a way of kind of, st as a strategy for working with, you know, things that you can or cannot say. He becomes more roundabout in what he's saying. He has to use more sort of um, metaphors that are not uh, direct, and in that way, you know, he says that it, it enables him to be more um, creative. And I asked him, "Are you serious about that?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah, he, he is." Um, but uh, uh, Wild Rice produces pretty much it has a sort of political satirical edge on pretty much everything it does, including its annual pantomime, uh, which last year was called Monkey Goes West, which was based on the adventures of the uh, monkey god or the monkey king, which is actually a political satire itself. Um, you know, we read it now as sort of like, you know, this tame fairy tale of what Hanuman does, but uh, and for its period, um, it, it was a satire against the authorities. Uh, in my preliminary sort of look at the themes that we can and cannot touch. In Southeast Asia, it seems that the one especially sensitive area is religion. Now, monks, priests, and imam may come in for some satire, but God herself do not. There's generally speaking an area, even without having um, written laws, that religion is something that is um, problematic. Uh, I'm going to continue with examples of, of Singapore here. This is a famous, uh, there's a lot of research done on cartoons, because cartoons, of course, you know, we don't need to kind of, the visual reference is very easy for us to pick up. This is a famous um, um, uh, a cartoon by Morgan Chua, who has just published a, um, a book of all his cartoons. Sneakily, somewhat, he's actually done some post uh, 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 a cartoon, so not those that were contemporary at the time, but sort of re, you know, t uh, um, indicating something in the past. But this was contemporary, and this resulted in um, the Singapore Herald, as it was, being closed down. That's what the reason was given. Uh, now, this I think is um, this is something that which also was contemporary. This is. Uh, I remember Al Arkham being um, demonized uh, as, 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 as part of, which involved a public confession by the leader of Al Arkham, Al Arkham movement on TV, on TV3, and it was live. Uh, this also, for dance uh, pioneer Go Le Kwan, she also was required to um, recant on national television uh, whether her husband, um, the playwright, Ko Pao Kun, sorry, uh, for alleged uh, communist links. Um, and this is the art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai. Uh, it has won several awards already for its work. Um, this is the, the, the idea, it's a beautiful idea. It's about a cartoonist who uh, wanted to make beautiful work and wanted to comment on his life growing up in Singapore. And the style, of, uh, the style of the book includes a lot of different, um, uh, you know, if, if you're a cartoon historian, then you, you know, there are at least five or six different designs that he uses, styles that he uses for um, telling the story itself. And then there's a punchline, which I really cannot say, um, but it's absolutely worthwhile getting the book for. Okay, um, to this country which some of us may know, uh, I'll be looking at uh, Instant Cafe Theatre Company uh, as a case study in detail for um, Theatre in Malaysia. And this is uh, YB, who actually has gone through various uh, developments um, as, a, as a character. Uh, I've started 
some initial interviews and so forth to find out. Um, and this is, uh, you, you know, you see the exaggeration of the corsage. It's huge, you know, uh, and um, you see this sort of, you know, busting out of the safari suit indicating uh, he's of a particular period. Um, and YB is his nickname. But he's been deputy minister for breaking records, deputy minister of misinformation. Uh, um, some of us are more familiar than others. And I'll be looking in particular at a uh, particular event that happened around the second first Bollywood Awards, the director's cut. Um, this is because uh, it combines a, a very interesting combination of how government, audience, and subject are combined. This is the first time, uh, as I understand, that this show was done in a nightclub, uh, uh, in a club and not just in a theater space. And uh, as a result of that, it had quite a lot of music-focused uh, pieces on it. And this was uh, one of them, which is um, showing a kind of P. Romley era of people um, singing and dancing. And, and the indication, the difference between that era and this uh, are very marked in terms of... Now, the, some of the songs, for example, there was a song sung of My Way, uh, and that goes... Regrets, I've had a few. Now I want to relax and young intention. Judges, I got to screw and I've leaked one you no opposition, and so on. These are the kinds of uh, uh, play on the irony uh, and the use of um, the techniques in terms of demonstrating the kind of um, uh, satire that's used. Uh, very interesting, this was an uh, article that appeared. Uh, two weeks before the show opened, um, and it was an interview with Jo Kukatas, the artistic director, and she was asked, you know, wh why, why aren't you on TV? And she answers, uh, well, you can get away with a lot more in theatre. Uh, and in terms of being able to understand the, the choices about what we can make to try and get on television, and what is required if you you know, want to reach to a larger audience, there are obviously compromises and artistic choices that you make. There's a lot more in there, but... Um, okay, so this is, this happens uh, uh, a day after the show closes. Um, City Hall says, no more performing license for Instant Cafe Theatre. And this is as a result of, you know how, I don't know if it happens in other countries, and we're going to find out in Southeast Asia, but one person makes a police report somewhere, and that becomes the perfect reason to close down something, um, and as it was the case here. But this was not a police report as such. Uh, sorry, uh, this was a, um, a letter of complaint to the editor in uh, Utusan, uh, in which uh, the writer said, you know, look, I went to see the show, and it was very um, uh, sensitive and it was problematic because it seemed to take, uh, um, it, it uh, mocked the Prime Minister and mocked the affirmative action policy. Uh, it's funny, I kind of, I'm talking as if I'm talking to people who don't know this, but uh, so, there, yeah, and then, so the outcome this, and then there's this big outcry. I mean, I don't think, that, one of my questions in the, thesis is, you know, why do outbreaks of satire occur? When something that is closed, you know, usually a satire is within a small community of some kind, and then it opens up out, and it's the opening up out and the reasons for that that need, are important to try and find out why and when that happens. And in this case, it's still an English language uh, paper, it's not, you know, we've already had a story happen within uh, um, um, Bahasa, and I'm looking at how Sinchu covers and how Tamil Nesan covers this, so whether it's a drop in the ocean. Uh, but so, no performing license. And there's a picture on page three, which, you know, it's, 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 do you more, where, where you see the producer having to sign, a bit like kind of, you know, Suharto bending before the IMF director, you know, sort of, she's having to sign this while the city hall officer is there saying sign this and you know because he was trying to close down the show um, but you can imagine that uh, and then what happens is well there's a you know a sort of um, a very strong editorial that comes out and says you know we are not Tehran says Wang Chunwei uh, 
and stands and says, you know, look, I didn't see the show, but I have Malay friends who went to see the show, and they, and they, yeah, okay, they, they, they had some problems, but basically, this is part and parcel of how we are a democracy. So it's very important um, that we keep Instant Cafe Theatre. This is a very, probably the most public so far, support for a theatre company that has been producing satirical reviews for over 25 years. Uh, but uh, now I would, sorry, because it is uh, selling ice to Eskimos or something, I'm going to talk a lot more about Malaysia. But look at Indonesia, which is my favorite example anyway. Uh, Indonesia, I've been living in Jakarta now for 11 years, um, although I've been based in Singapore for the last year and a bit doing coursework. Uh, it's been a very interesting experience to see things, you cannot help but see things through a Malaysian prism. So sometimes living in Jakarta feels so near, but so far. Uh, and let me show you examples of what I think um, uh, make it especially interesting. Um, okay, so I'll be looking at uh, Republic Mimpi, which is uh, uh, news.com, which was a uh, show that was on, uh, first of all, it was on Indosia, which is, it's a private channel, but like, you know, terrestrial. It's not like you have to sort of, you know, buy into a really expensive uh, uh, satire, uh, sorry, satire, but, um, satellite uh, uh, channel and, and, be, and have to, to um, pay for it. Uh, this is, this is, um, so, so in looking at this show, which I will show you, uh, shortly, an a, example of how it works and why I think it's so interesting. Um, it's broadcast first on Indosia and then on, on Metro TV. And Metro TV is maybe kind of like a TV3, also a terrestrial channel, very widely watched. Uh, uh, and I think part of it, uh, though I'm not sure yet, is because Indosia previously had been broadcasting live shows of uh, Wayang Champusari programs in which you see contemporary Wayang where, you know, it's not that kind of three-day version of the, you know, true authentic type, but it's actually something that has been chopped and changed and, and, and um, the latest version of traditional um, for, for audience, or audiences. Now, okay, so in, in looking, starting to begin to look at uh, political satire, I mean, of course, this is, you know, Wayang there's so much scholarship on Wayang in Southeast Asia and, and satire that, you know, you, you, it's, it's, what can you say that's going to be new? Um, but surely there are other uh, aspects other than the fact that Wayang is constantly reinvented. Um, but it's very important to note that Sama is a very important character for, uh, you know, as he's not to be put within just a traditional framework. He's very, very contemporary, at least if you look at some of the Champosari that are broadcast still, as well as some of the shows, depending on which Dalang. But some of the clowns appear um, to sort of like take a break, you know, allow the audience to sort of take a break from the main parts of the story. And that's when you see most of the satirical comments made uh, in terms of whether it's figures of authority, um, figures of... Um, um, government or whatever the guys like, and they say nonsensical things. Um, and there's a tradition of placetan, which is, I think, it's kind of, you'll see it later, but it's a kind of like a malapropism. You, you know, you use a word that's similar to what it is, but it's definitely not, and therefore there is the incongruous laughter that results. And of course, clowns and the fool, these are very universal, it can be said. The few things that you can say, you know, given that it's very important to look at satire within a particular context, the fool and clowns are universal in terms of their importance for humor and satire. Um, okay, opera quechua, which is cockroach opera. Um, I'm, we'll be looking a little bit at uh, theater, isn't that a horrible picture? <laughs> yeah, we'll be looking at uh, theater coma, uh, as a kind of comparison to uh, Instant Cafe because they are actually 40, nearly 40 over years old um, and they have been producing uh, work um, much like Instant Cafe in terms of a con combination of more satiric, overtly satirical work as well as um, conventional um, theatre productions which have kind of made it big. Um, 
I mean, I think what's interesting about Instant Cafe is that they talk about Monty Python as being a very important influence. Uh, um, and um, uh, in terms of the you know, influence for Tietokoma and um, um, the, the husband and wife team who are both in themselves the director and uh, performer as well as producers. They, talk, they have done a lot of work of Brecht and um, you know, all the sort of great Western, European in particular, theatre. They have done versions. They have translated them into Bahasa Indonesia and directed them um, over the years. So I'm, using, I'm just looking at Opera Quechua here because the first show was done in 1985 and it has been produced subsequently. Uh, and in the year where the event happened for Insta Cafe, um, they uh, produced a show at uh, Ismail, Taman Ismail Mazuki, uh, Tim in Jakarta. And this was uh, quite different an experience compared to the time they did it in 1985. In 1985, they actually had to face um, 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 a tank with th uh, three individuals on the tank coming into the box office uh, to stop the show, um, and uh, I mean, when you hear the sort of the stories about what happened, uh, the, I think the, one of the bravest is that uh, Pat Nana says that you know he was asked, he asked the head, "Why are you closing down this show? There's there's the you know, the military vehicle. Why are you closing down this show?" And the officer says, "Well, because the handphone. I got the message from the handphone." And Pat Nana says, well, I'm not listening to a handphone. And continues with the show until, until the officer has to struggle and find a way to say, oh, eventually he discovers that uh, the problem is they don't have the license to perform. And there is this idea of how this veneer of the legal is very important for all, for all uh, practices, whether it is for both the authoritative, uh, authoritarian make, uh, are looking to close down a show, or indeed for those looking to produce it. It's who, how people invent, you know, use the law for their purposes. Um, uh, and this was an example uh, of some of the, co the coverage. Uh, the, star, the rock star um, academic that I mentioned, um, before Ariel Herianto, he said he noticed that there were distinct absences of any of the references to Islam and the Imam, which had been in the 1985 version. By 2005, uh, he said he noticed that was very absent, and that. And when I asked, but uh, no, no, he said no. It, they used the same script, um, but I would have to watch you know, for, for the actual footage to, in order to see whether whose perception was correct. Because when I asked Pat Nano now whether he, there's any subject that he's, you know, not willing to touch, and he says, yes, it's Islam. He does not want to, um, uh, that's the one area that he will not look at. So this is, this is an example of the kind of, uh, this is translation by uh, John McGlynn um, from Lonta. It's a bit of a sort of stuffy, awkward one, but, um, the story is about trans, well, he, in the book it's transvestites, but in the characters, you know, uh, uh, they're not transvestites, so they're not all transvestites. And it's how they cope. They are the so-called Quechua of, of Jakarta, and it's how they cope with, um, you know, co with police who come and arrest them, with uh, various religious figures who come and arrest them. Um, so it's that last line, um, you know, well, you can read it. I could steal, but that's against the law, which is a nice kind of punchline to have for that, I think. Okay, so uh, let me look at republicmimpinews.com now. Uh, imagine a live studio audience format. Um, this was first broadcast in 2004, and it went on for through, through basically three, four, three, four seasons, um, uh, and every week, um, and it employed actors playing none other than past and then current presidents of Indonesia at the panel. Uh, and the live audience were all, um, 
undergrads. They were chosen from each universitas, UE one time, and then you know, all from around the country, bust over to come and participate in the show. And they basically can get to ask questions um, uh, from the trivial to the serious, you know, like uh, ask um, why does, you know, uh, SBA, the president then, wear his, well, Malaysian is Songko at a particular angle. Why, why is that so? Uh, and um, the, the actor, who's a very well-known uh, performer, he was actually doing monologues about uh, acting as SBA, the president, even before this show started. So he kind of became the, the superstar of the show in a way, apart from being the president. So Republic Mimpi is a kind of imaginary, uh, uh, Republic Mimpi means kind of, you know, drunk, drunken republic. Uh, and it's an imaginary place. So we know that it's not the Republic of Indonesia, it is Republic Mimpi. And these are very spokespersons of the show. So um, let me just go through, because it, it's worth looking at them a little closely. In Carnival, which is a kind of Bactinian theory of what makes something funny and what, what, what is something as resistance, what counts as resistance, it is doubling. So these are the actors. So Pak Suharta, which is, you know, the furthest name you could think of that would be close to Suharto, uh, is the president, uh, sorry, is, is a former pre uh, president of Republic Mimpi. Uh, Pak Habidi was um, a spokesperson. Uh, and, you know, whenever they speak, you, you get, as, as you'll see, but, you know, you kind of have to have lived through the time to know their tics. But he was the first president with a, with a he spent a lot of time in Germany. And uh, he's, he's very well respected for being, you know, for being first uh, president with scientific and particularly engineering training. So when he speaks Bahasa Indonesia, he has this kind of, well, it's exaggerated, but the sort of German, don't know what kind of accent that's happening as he speaks. Um, and you know it's him. And everything has got to be tied to a question of technology and um, uh, uh, science. Gus Dur, uh, or Gus Pur, rather, uh, he was a blind cleric. They always announce him as blind cleric. Uh, and uh, the great thing about Guspur is that, like perhaps one of our prime ministers, he's forever falling asleep and wakes up in the middle of something and then kind of, ah, you know, he will then give his opinion about what's happening um, and it usually doesn't have anything to do with what the discussion is about. Uh, Mega Kati. Um, she was sort of a little well known for, if she got a difficult question, then she just answered something else. <laughs> uh, so that's actually what happens when she speaks. Various, now, you know, given the sort of, and it is still, the, you know, the gender disparity between, there are three, there have been three performers for uh, Mega, Mega Karti because she's either been involved with family, she's either been, you know, she's had to do other things, whereas the guys have basically stayed uh, all the same. But yeah. She, she, she doesn't answer a question, or she ties everything back to the fact that her father was the, uh, the first president of Indonesia. And this is uh, Butet, who plays Si Butet Yogya. Um, and the similarity is obvious. And this is Jawo Kwat. Jawo is actually his actual name, is the, the performer. And you will know that uh, Jeka or Yusuf Kala is still, or rather he's vice president currently under um, the, the uh, the dear Pak Jokowi, uh, and he's very popular. You see, the format of the show includes sometimes that it goes away from the goes away from the uh, uh, studio and into actual streets. So you you get interviews with street children. You get interviews with um, um, there's even one that says, uh, uh, where um, he tries to sell his sexual prowess, um, and it's it's a wonderful program. Uh, news.com. Okay, so I'm just going to show you some of it, but um, I'll translate it generally rather than stop and start. Um, so what happens is you hear the song, the opening song for the for the show, and you get a sense of the sort of live vibe of it, and then you cut to two their personalities in their own right, and they are the kind of uh, spoke, they they act as mediators between the audience and the um, uh, and the panel of presidents, um, and uh, sorry, just check. And they they will be they ask. We have this extraordinary situation. This was broadcast when Su uh, Suharto was still alive, but uh, in you know in 
house, not a rest, but you know, he was ill. So you have a lot of discussion. You see pa Suharta, uh, he's asked, you know, oh, uh, how are you? And he, and he does this kind of, you know, uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm somewhat well, you know, but you, you can have a look. Uh, and then I'll stop it just at a point, um, which is an indication of the kinds of political satire, the functions of satire as it's working. So uh, how do I do this? Yeah. janji kami tadi kita akan menghadirkan mantan presiden Republik Mimpi yang agak jangan hadir karena gangguan kesehatan ya langsung saja kita berikan tepuk tangan yang meriah untuk Bapak Suharta So this is Suharta sorry Pak Suharta appearing on the show live Selamat datang Pak Suharta apa kabar agak kurang sehat <laughs> How long are you going to stay today? So he says, you know, that's got to be directed to my, my lawyer, basically. And Okay, sorry, can you just pause for a moment? Thank you. Okay, so this is uh, Asagaf, who is actually Suharto's lawyer, the actual lawyer at the time. And um, the point of the program is to have Pat Suharta there to address some of the questions that an activist would like to ask him. Uh, so then what happens? Sorry, can you play? Yep. So in line with the time of the show, what they've done is get a copy of the real lawyer, but call him Yasagaf instead of Asagaf. And this is the first time that he's seeing him. He's referring to, you know, well, how bold he is basically. Okay, so basically he repeats, you know, that you know, so he can only stay for five minutes, but he's his lawyer speaking on behalf of his client. Which is a fee, you know, official approval from the doctor, the official doctor. Okay, can you pause there? Thank you. So this is the, the then current president. So this is our young Ahmad Babahagia. Najib, for example, someone playing him. Who would play Najib? Anyone? Our prime minister? Well, this actor is the person who is playing then current president. And the way, the accent and his tone, the baritone and the way that he speaks, that is all, these are mimicking uh, the actual uh, president, so there's no mistaking who it is. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you can play. 
mendiskusikan mengenai Bapak Suharta, kasusnya Bapak Suharta itu, tapi waktunya hanya lima menit saja karena dibatasi atas instruksi dari istana demi kesehatan Bapak Suharta. So, so by making such a big deal of the five minutes. Waktu lima menit itu, karena menurut seorang pakar hukum ternama Evita Mara. Evita Mara. Is a famous dangdut singer. Emang nak kasih waktu itu popular di Tendi. Dia mengatakan, mengatakan apa pak? Lima minit lagi. So, so then he mocks the whole idea of the five minutes as being kind of like, so it's as if she's you know in some kind of sexual action. So then the tone changes. Saya mau soalnya. Tapi saya juga korban anda. Selama tiga tahun. Anda menangkap saya dengan teman-teman dari Institut Teknologi Bandung pada 5 Agustus 89 mencuri, yes, actual activist. Kemudian membuang kami ke Nusa Kambangan. Anda adalah pelakunya. Fajrul Rahman. Yang kedua, kami juga apa yang kami tuntut? Kami menuntut Anda untuk turun dari jabatan pada waktu itu sebagai presiden dan kami menuntut Anda untuk mengembalikan harta. Anda bersama keluarga sebesar antara 350 triliun sampai 600 triliun rupiah. Okay, can we just pause there? So um, that's just basically he's now directly asking a real question to the fake, sorry, to the president, the former president of Republic Mimpi, and he's he's saying that he himself was kidnapped together with other students from Itebe, and he also asks about where has um, a certain amount, well, it's a 350 trillion or so, where has that money gone? It's a direct question to his president and may have some parallels for us. Um, uh, and there's a little bit more I'd like to show you and then uh, we'll close. Thank you. Hey, not quite. Yeah, just to play. Ah. Tapi saya juga korban anda. Selama tiga tahun, anda menangkap saya dengan teman-teman dari Institut Teknologi Bandung pada 5 Agustus 89, mencuri, menangkap, kemudian membuang kami ke Nusa Kambangan. Anda adalah pelakunya. Okay, I'm just gonna stop there. But so how he replies, of course, is speak to my lawyer. So then what happens is a, is a, is a, is a discussion between uh, the lawyer and um, the activist in which the lawyer, uh, the real lawyer, yeah, at this point, uh, Pak Yasagaf actually stays out of it. And at one point, J.K. says, are you, you know, what are you doing? I mean, aren't you paid good money to speak? Why aren't you speaking? All lawyers get a lot of money, etc., etc. But um, Yasag uh, Asagaf is then required to respond and say why he is, you know, he used to be, in the opposition and, and an activist as well. How come he as a lawyer is now representing Pat Suharta? Uh, and um, uh, he responds that, well, you know, yes, it's true, but my profession as a lawyer requires me to be able to represent even the most challenging kind of client that's required, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, it, you know, I, we'll have to stop there, but it, this episode in particular is really a very, very, um, to me anyway, quite astounding example of the range of humor techniques and sat satire that is happening and the fact that uh, it was contemporary at the time. And if we imagine, at least in a Malaysian context, that happening, it's, that's part of the kind of so near yet so far perspective. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll just round up now. Can you pass, get to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so uh, there is a very, well, he must be an artist because he wears a beret, um, but he, he's very brani, this fella. Uh, his name is Fami Reza, and he is currently conducting, well, I don't know that I'm saying anything new to anyone in the audience, but uh, he is, um, be, from an analysis point of view, he is using the continued imagery of the clown uh, but you know, to 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 continue a campaign of resistance uh, in relation to uh, um, responding to this, you know, keeping a particular issue in in our public eye, and uh, he is, a, you know, 
I think, quite fearless uh, as an example of, of somebody who is doing the work. But um, there is a lot of social media memes. I will be just looking at particular work of uh, um, certain artists and how their work transpires. And because this is contemporary, it's very important to follow. So there are times when I'm actually photocopying per hour because for fear that something's going to happen. But anyway, thank you. Next. Oh, I think next. I'm the number one. Sorry. We, we practiced that before. Uh, so I started with this idea that, you know, uh, fire is um, an integral part of, of how we are, that, f you know, it is something which is both positive and negative, and, and exactly how and what we use, uh, what purposes we put to it. Um, this is example is, 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 is how telling and how effective political satire may be said to be. This is an example of hell money, um, which, which I hope, you know, with my research so far, uh, there has been no problem, but, you know, um, we'll see as to what happens next. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if we want a conclusion and destination, I would say that gelatophobia could be a fear of ice cream. Um, but etymology of satire is, of course, dependent on time, place, and language. Contemporary satire is not just literary. Literary, It has no political allegiance, which makes it difficult. I'll be looking closely for more right-wing, shall we say, examples of satire, so it doesn't fit such a neat notion of satire as resistance. Um, more diversity within a country than between countries, says the foremost person who's been looking at intercultural humor uh, for the last 40 years, and um, competitive authoritarianisms as Levitsky and Wade describe the kind of hybrid democracies that exist in, in Southeast Asia. It's most obviously in online forums, but uh, that's just because I'm choosing to be looking at social media memes. But there is satire happening every time you go to the bathroom in terms of what you could be thinking, I don't know. But satire, I would suggest, doesn't actually burn the house down, but it certainly warms and blisters. It's the great argument as to whether if you see a, 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 a cartoon, if you see an image, does that actually make you go out on the street? There's interesting discussions right now about the idea that social media makes just apathy, in fact. Um, but as, uh, as, as various academics have, point, have pointed out, the issue is more about whether there is good organization on the ground to be able to organize uh, uh, marches, to be able to you know, deal with uh, spontaneous demonstrations if they happen. Um, apart from that, I think uh, I would just have to say thank you very much to Rahel and to the Ilham Gallery and to all of you for your patience. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed and learned something today. Thank you.